So the title of my project is The Effect of Attention Biases on Episodic Future Simulations in Generalized Anxiety Disorder, which that title incorporates a lot of pieces. And I'd like to start with Generalized Anxiety Disorder. What is it? It's an anxiety disorder that's characterized by excessive, persistent worrying about a lot of different things. For example, performance at work or school, health, safety, finances. It's a lot of worrying about a lot of different things. And worrying in generalized anxiety disorder has been studied quite extensively. It's been shown to be a verbal form of future thinking that's very that's very integral to generalized anxiety disorder. Now I'd like to introduce another type of future thinking by having you do a little exercise. I want you to picture dinner for tonight. In your mind's eye, think of where you would be, who you'd be with, what would be going on in dinner for a second. What, that, what you just did is called an episodic future simulation. Uh, it's a visual form of future thinking that has not been studied extensively in generalized anxiety disorder as opposed to verbal future thinking, which has. So we were interested in looking at the difference between visual and verbal future thinking in generalized anxiety disorder. And another portion, the last portion of my project is attention biases. Attention biases are people's tendency to pick up on certain information in the environment, but not other information. And people with anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder, tend to pick up on threatening information more than on neutral information and more than healthy participants do for the same type of information. So this attention bias can come in three forms. Uh, it could be increased interpretation of ambiguous information as threatening, increased orientation towards threatening information, and decreased ability to disengage from the threatening information. It's been shown that attention biases may have a causal effect in anxiety in that inducing attention biases led to increased anxious responding. So we know that attention biases affect emotional processing in the present moment, but what we don't know is how they affect processing of future events. And specifically, what that brings me to my question, which is, what is the effect of attention biases on episodic future simulations in generalized anxiety disorder? This has not been looked at, how these biases towards threatening information affect this type of future thinking in generalized anxiety. So how did I do this? We started with episodic future simulations, which I will show you an example. Here, uh, we had people come in and uh, we used a paradigm created by Carl Spooner and Dan Schachter at Harvard. We had participants come in and list 110 people, places, and objects that they were familiar with. This, these are examples of people, places, and objects, Charles. Eastern Standard and a pen. Uh, these were randomly combined to form a person place object triad, combined also with a random emotional tag, either positive, negative, or neutral. When the participants came back for the second session, they just saw the first four parts, not the red part at the bottom. And they were asked to imagine a future scenario that includes the person, place, and object that would make them feel the target emotion. Then they wrote out a short description to help prompt them when they came back the next day. And that's what I have written in red on the bottom. That's kind of a hint as to what they thought about. Maybe Charles had a really cool pen that he was writing with at Eastern Standard. And for the last session, half of the, ses half of the scenarios were repeated four times each, and half were repeated only once. And after each scenario was presented for the last time, there were five ratings of how plausible the event seems, how detailed the mental image was, how easy it was to come up with this mental image, how exciting versus calming the mental image was, and how positive or negative the mental image made them feel. To look at attention biases, I used two tasks, the first of which was the emotional stroop task. I used a card-based version. This is an example of the threat words card. The original stroop task has 
color words printed in different colors of ink. So for example, the word blue would be printed in red. And the task would be to name the color of the ink, not the word itself. But the semantic content of the word is very highly distracting to people who speak the language of the word. The modified Stroop task, the emotional Stroop, looks at how distracting the content of these words are to the reader. So the more distracting the word, the higher the bias towards that word. Thus, in attention biases towards threat, negative words are more distracting than neutral words. So we compared the reaction times, the card reading times, for naming the colors of this card versus naming colors of the neutral card for each participant. The other task was the visual dot probe task. This was presented on the computer in a, in a procedure that looked a little bit like this. You start with a fixation cross, then a word pair that's one neutral word and one negative word, and a probe that replaces either the neutral word on top, the neutral word on bottom, the negative word on top, or the negative word on bottom. Each word pair was presented four times in a counterbalanced manner. We used E or F instead of the colon, but the participant's task was just to say whether it was an E or an F. Here the difference in attention biases is interpreted from the difference in reaction times to congruent versus incongruent trials. Congruent meaning when the probe replaces the negative word, incongruent when the probe replaces the neutral word. This is based on the theory that if a person has an attention bias, they would already be looking at the negative word, so the probe replacing the negative word would be congruent to their attention bias. Now here are the results. For the emotional Stroop task, there was no difference between groups on any of the particular cards. There was also no difference between cards for the generalized anxiety disorder group. The, the GAD word card, the threatening word card, was not more distracting than the neutral or positive card. There was a significant effect for healthy participants that the generalized anxiety disorder card was more distracting than the neutral and positive cards. The emotional Stroop index, which we calculated as a measure of attention bias, as the difference between reading time on the threat words card and reading time on the neutral word card, were not statistically significant between the two groups. For the dot probe task, there was no difference within each group between congruent and incongruent reaction time trials. And although it doesn't look this way on the graph, the difference between groups was also not statistically significant. If you look on the axis, you can see that the scale here is about 600 milliseconds, and the difference between the groups is about 20 milliseconds, which is why this difference is not statistically significant. Uh, the dot probe index, which was a similar attention bias measure that looked at the difference between congruent and incongruent reaction times was also not statistically different between the two groups. So what do we make of these results? These are pretty unexpected findings in that previous research has shown a very robust attention bias towards threat in generalized anxiety disorder patients and not in healthy controls. There have been studies that found a bias towards threat for healthy controls in a blocked design emotional Stroop task, which is what this was. But in those studies, they found that generalized anxiety disorder patients still had a higher attention bias, not that there was no difference between the groups. Because of these unexpected findings, we couldn't actually perform the target analyses looking at the effect of attention bias on thinking about the future, on the ratings of emo on the future simulations. And we were thinking of what possible explanations there may be for the findings that we came up with. There have been a number of studies done with different demographics, different sample sizes, and different methodologies. And we tried to address each possible option. The demographics were pretty similar to previous studies. The sample size was pretty comparable to previous studies, and the methodology was taken from previous studies that did find statistically significant results. So it's not really clear what caused these issues. Um, we did find a very large variability in reaction times but in, within both groups, the healthy and the GAD groups. There was a very large range of attention bias index times, uh, which 
may be contributing to the strange findings, but we're not sure what caused the variability. The question that I set out to answer is still unanswered, and I would like to say that it's still a valid question in that just because the, these results here were not showing anything in particular, that does not mean that the question, that attention biases do not have an effect on future thinking in, ge in generalized anxiety disorder. So I would be interested to find out how this can continue trying to answer that question in that potential implications of answering that question are through treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. There is a relatively new treatment for attention biases called attention bias modification that has been shown to change attention biases and if we suspect that attention biases affect the way that people with generalized anxiety disorder think about the future, changing attention biases may change the characteristics of that person's disorder in some way. So these were some of the works cited. I put the most important ones. And I would like to acknowledge the people who absolutely made this happen and that I could not never have done this alone and recruited 60 participants over the course of the last year. So Jade, Stefan, um, who have guided me through the psychotherapy and emotion research lab who are here to support me today. I'm so happy about that. Um, Carl, who has helped us from Harvard in terms of both the methodology and the interpretation of the results, and of course, the Kilishan Honors College. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes? You started to touch on this at the end, but I'm sort of interested in putting it into broader perspective. This study, is it mostly for therapeutic um, purposes that you think about or try to alter people's uh, perception? So the question was if we are looking at to alter people's attention biases for therapeutic purposes, uh, and that is a large and growing field in a attention bias research is changing attention biases to see what effect that has on anxiety, not only on attention biases, that research has shown that if you train attention biases, that training maintains itself. They, the attention biases are shifted for a relatively prolonged period of time, and there is indication that it also improves anxiety responding. So there's always ways, we're always looking for ways to improve treatment, either to add it on to existing treatment or change treatment or create new treatments, so it's all going in that direction. Yes? Um, if you were going to continue this project, what would you foresee as your next step? In terms of attention biases, I would probably look more into maybe specific issues of variability to try to see if there was a way that that could have been addressed, uh, if there was something. This did take place over the course of a year, so maybe it was the weather. It's not really sure. There's a lot of different factors that may have been involved there, so that would be probably the next step. If I could do it all over again, I would never expect participants to actually come when they said they were going to come. <laughs> I would never assume that. Um, that I think I would possibly check in on the methodology over the course of the project and make sure that it was actually um, working the way it was intended to work. There was a a small issue that came up at some point where I realized I was coding something incorrectly and I had to recode a lot of things and um, would have been easier if that was something that was that I had maintained over the course of the project. What was your sample size? Uh, for this portion of the project, the sample size were 18 people in the healthy group and 17 people in, sorry, 19 people in the final version, it was 19 people in the healthy group and 18 people in the generalized anxiety disorder group. Okay. Thank you very much.